Good day, wherever you may be joining us from, and welcome to this session titled Perspectives on Securing Digital Financial Inclusion in Africa. My name is Nanjira Sambuli. I'm a fellow of the Technology and International Affairs Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I oversee the project we will be discussing today titled CyberFi. So a bit about CyberFi or Cybersecurity, Capacity Development and Financial Inclusion. This is a project that brings together um, a robust community of practitioners and researchers working on digital financial inclusion. Through discussions and convenings with government policymakers, regulators, cybersecurity specialists, and development community actors, it became evident that in-depth country-specific context was often missing from work on digital financial inclusion. So for example, what kinds of capacity development projects were succeeding? How does information sharing and technical support systems exist on paper versus in practice? And how clear are regulatory processes from emerging markets in digital financial services? What are the gaps? What are the overlaps in policy and in practice? For us, we're motivated by the fact that contextualizing the digital transformation of the financial systems across low and lower middle income countries is a critical step towards understanding the determinants of security and trust in digital financial services to foster secure digital development. So for this project, we also want to show how most Western markets can also learn from the illuminating insights emerging from these markets that are taking a markedly different approach to both financial inclusion and digital inclusion and often simultaneously. For this project, we engaged researchers with deep subject matter expertise and experience in financial inclusion developments, focusing on six countries in Africa to start, that help capture the diversity of the ecosystems across the continent. So the countries represented in this project are Cameroon, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. Through CyberFi, we're aiming to contribute to the understanding of digital financial inclusion in Africa by going beyond the surface of prevailing narratives and as part of this process, to confront prevailing ideas about the shortcomings and needs associated with building capacity in Africa. Joining me today are three scholars who've contributed to this project. Noel van der Waag Kowling is the Cyber Program Lead at the Security Institute for Governance and Leadership at the Stellenbosch University. Her work cuts across both the public and private sectors and has a strong focus on governance, policy, and strategic issues in information uh, security. He teaches cyber warfare and low intensity in the Department of Strategic Studies and serves the review board of the International Journal of Cyber Warfare and Terrorism. Welcome, Noel. We're also joined by Elizabeth Kolade, who is a Nigeria based multidisciplinary cybersecurity pro professional with experience spanning the private sector, government service, and nonprofits. She is adept at helping organizations make sound decisions on risk management policy development and implementation, forestalling cyber attacks and handling and recovering from cyber incidents. Last but not least, we're joined by Tomslin Samin La, who is a senior principal consultant at Genesis, who specializes in um, cybersecurity and also serves as vice chair of the Generic Names Supporting Organization Council. Noel, Elizabeth, Tomslin, thank you so much for joining me today. So first, let me come to you, Noel, to set a quick context for our listeners today about the, the context you studied in South Africa and the market they're in. Please go ahead. Thank you, Nanjira. Yes, uh, South Africa, I think, is a market with uh, some incredibly unique dynamics, um, both within Africa but, but globally, and, and that's largely driven by the tremendous gap between rich and poor in South Africa. Um, so, what you're really looking at in some cases in a very, very advanced economy, a very advanced service economy, um, a strong IT sector and a strong financial system in play, uh, people with well-resourced individuals accessing the services that, that this provides, um, working in top-end types of professions, and then the underbanked, uh, people stricken by poverty, previous exclusion due to apartheid, uh, falling really on the wrong side, side of the digital revolution, if I can put it that way. And how do these people access products? And yet we see the appetite in, in the population to advance, to move forward, to 
uh, I think, build legacies and, and something to leave your children, etc. So we're seeing a hunger for investment. And this d digital financial inclusion is really driving that market far more than just banking. So the, the, the population that is, that is really leveraging these services is the previously underbanked population, made possible by things like fractional ownership, where off an app you can invest a minuscule amount of money and actually start building an investment, for example, or do your banking and not have to go to the expense of catching a bus or a taxi into town. So, so digital really helps people in this, in this um, class to actually leapfrog previous issues, obstacles towards banking. So we have have that in play, but then then what we see is uh, some some really pressing systemic issues relating to digital security, information security, and and one of them, for example, is the lack of a national cyber strategy, um, and the the trickle down cascading effect that this has actually had in not making it clear what, where we're we going and how we're we going to get there if I can put it that way. So what we have in place is, is actually a 10-year-old document that's actually a policy-making framework. Having said all of that, um, there is still an ecosystem of regulators and legislation that's come out around cyber, but oftentimes what we see is on the policy front or on the, on the legislation front, we're doing well, it's rolled out now when it comes to implementation, well, that's where we get stuck. And I think that's part of our problem. So, for example, um, apologies for that. I think we lost Noel. We'll just give it a minute. Well, as we wait for her to get back online, let me invite Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, you had um, the fortune of studying a really interesting market, which is Nigeria. Why don't you, why don't you give us a snapshot of um, the vast majority of interesting things you found uh, in your study? Sorry, can you hear me? Nigeria. All right, Noel is back. Um, should I go ahead or just wait for her to wrap up? Yeah, Noel, you can wrap up. I think you were just about Thank to get <laughs> to apologize. No um, so initially, uh, I think what I'm saying is we, we have some rather high levels of risk concentration in South Africa. And one of them, for example, is regard to, to mobile communications who interface all these services where 80% of consumers access through two specific companies. So if those companies don't act in a certain way, it exposes millions of consumers. Uh, so so that, that is one of the other issues that we're dealing with in South Africa. Thank you. For that. And we'll come back to a concept you introduced in your essay, Digital Deprivation. Um, Noelle's essay is already live on the Carnegie website, so do have a look at that. But Elizabeth, back to you. Tell us a bit about what you found in the Nigerian landscape. Sorry. Um, the Nigerian financial landscape um, has grown significantly in the past um, few years. I'm also looking at the digital aspect of it, talking about the digital financial um, ecosystem has also grown, um, featuring a wide array of um, quite a number of digital solutions um, targeted to, to, to drive consumers and customers basically on um, financial services. Um, also, this also comes with um, associated risk um, and other components. Um, that's where we have um, quite a number of um, regulatory frameworks um, um, to help manage um, some of these issues that have come up. And we have um, the Central Bank of Nigeria, which is the lead um, regulatory agency for the financial um, institutions here in Nigeria, um, which has um, done some really commendable work. Um, we have quite also have quite a number of um, really beautiful documents, um, frameworks and instruments um, to help to drive um, activities within this um, ecosystem, and um, which also puts um, responsibility on quite a number of um, financial institutions um, within this ecosystem. Um, at the core of all of this, um, we have the consumers, um, the customers, the end users, um, how they relate and interact with um, these solutions, how they relate and interact with um, these um, organizations, these service, um, 
um, providers. And for when we speak of consumers, um, we have to talk about trust and um, confidence in some of these um, solutions and these institutions um, that provide them um, some of these services. Because we're talking about money here, we're talking about finance, wherever money is, there is a, there's a need for a high level of trust. And um, like I mentioned earlier, yes, the CBN gets some um, really good commendation for some of the work that have come up um, um, frameworks and instruments. We have the risk-based um, cybersecurity framework and guidelines for deposit money banks and payment service providers. We also have one for other financial institutions. We also have the national cybersecurity policy and strategy. We have um, the 2021 version, which is the second um, iteration of these documents. We have the national Nigerian data protection regulation. We also have the Cybercrime Act. So there are a whole lot of instruments um, basically to help to regulate um, this um, ecosystem, this industry, and um, try to mitigate the security implications. And at the end of it, I think all of this is geared towards um, enhancing um, end user trust. Now in speaking to financial inclusion, we've also experienced um, the introduction of quite a number of services and solutions, um, which um, the concept basically is to reach out to um, to promote financial inclusion, to reach out to the unbanked. Um, however, I would like to draw attention to um, one, which is the eNaira that was launched um, sometime last year in 2021, um, push, um, pushed out by the Central Bank of Nigeria. However, earlier reactions of um, this um, service, there were mixed reactions basically from end users. One which caught my eye was the need for users to basically link their existing bank account numbers um, to when signing up to the INERA, which also raises the question of financial inclusion, because if we're trying to reach out to the unbanked population and there's a request to um, link um, existing bank accounts, how does this um, meet the question on the need to reach out to the unbanked population within the Nigerian financial ecosystem? So it's a really interesting one. Um, another thing which, um, which is really interesting is um, the CBN collaborates with um, quite a number of stakeholders um, to regulate um, certain sectors within the Nigerian um, financial ecosystem. For example, the CBN collaborates with the Security and Exchange Commission to regulate the cryptocurrency um, ecosystem um, within the Nigerian financial um, ecosystem. So it's it's really it's, it's it was actually um, very interesting to uncover. There, there are so many areas to um, uncover when it comes to Nigeria, and I look forward to discussing more of that as well. Thank you, Elizabeth. And it's interesting to note that um, the eNaira, uh, as a central bank digital currency, has somewhat preceded mobile money being approved as a service offered by the telecommunications sector providers um, in Nigeria. And we can come back to that about what um, your analysis is around whether any of these movements actually do translate to. Um, roadmaps for financial inclusion because as you rightfully point out the e naira is still tied to a bank account so what happens to those who are unbanked in that sense but before we get to that tom's lynn you looked at a market that is usually not typically discussed um, when people talk about africa you hear the kenya nigeria um south africa trifecta but you bring in a fascinating perspective of cameroon please share with us um uh, please educate us actually about cameroon as <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, Nigeria, and, and and this is why I was very keen on on looking at and this, um, especially the Central African uh, countries, um, because they they seem to be a little bit different the way they're regulated, and and Cameroon, alongside five others in in the Central African Economic and Monetary Community, that's the CEMAC as it's called, uh, this includes Chad. Central African Republic, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, and Republic of Congo. These are countries whose regulation in the financial sector is done at a regional, the CEMAC level. And, and it's quite different from most countries because the, the, the CEMAC um, defines these regulations. Um, it is it, it, it's basically uh, sanctioned by a banking commission, which also sits at the Central African regional level. And then the country's ministry of finance takes a supervisory role uh, and, and sort of implementation role of this as well. So um, 
it, it was it was um, it was important to to bring this perspective as well into the project because um, we often hear of all these other countries being um, looked into and and uh, and the, the Central African countries are not. I mean, one has just come into the limelight recently. So, <laughs> uh, but um, we've, uh, regardless of this um, framework, regulatory framework, uh, one thing that was 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 important is that the the regulation of the ICT infrastructure itself and and. This, whether it's used for financial services or any other digital services, remained the rep responsibility of the individual state. So, the region, uh, the, the 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 regional CEMAC didn't uh, exactly recommend specific or tangible uh, policies for cybersecurity or, or security uh, of of digital. Um, uh, infrastructure. So this remained within the states, and, and in this, in the case of Cameroon, uh, while there is no single unified policy document um, or any sort of formal cybersecurity strategy, there is a law uh, which is called Law uh, Number 2010 uh, of 21 December 2010 on cybersecurity and cybercrime. Uh, contains a majority, the majority of cybersecurity policies in Cameroon, actually, and um, the National Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, it, in it, they call it ANTIC, in short, serves as the regulator. Now, um, when I was looking at this paper, the work started with stakeholder mapping exercises, and and. During that exercise, um, where I was really looking to understand who the players are and the forces that were influencing the fintech industry in Cameroon. And, and while doing that, two things uh, uh, caught my attention. And the sudden high rate of use of digital services between 2017 and now, and knowing how digital services startups can be disruptive. Uh, I was looking at Cameroon and wondering, um, how does that first mover mentality in digital services startups align with, with, with this sort of regulatory framework, which has a very hierarchical structure which is also not even managed within the country itself even though it's 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 implemented by the ministry so uh, i wanted to know whether these startups make uh whether there's any of these forces that influence how these startups uh whether they even make cybersecurity a priority and or not and if they do what influences them and so that was that, that's what led to 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 the study. Um, the other thing I was interested in knowing is whether these young entrepreneurs were even aware of the existing cybersecurity laws. Um, so yeah, uh, this this really led to the the, the study where I, I I developed a questionnaire which questioned their knowledge of regulations, um, their market strategy, um, their cybersecurity policy, whether they had any or not, their risk management, and their cybersecurity reporting as well. Uh, and most importantly, uh, it, it also questioned their consumer trust uh, development strategies. So um, this, this was what I looked at. Thanks. Thank you, Tom's Lynn, and thank you to you all for the first round. I think some common themes that do emerge from all these essays has been assessment of the regulatory environment and the sort of players in that space, um, how innovation, be it from the new sort of fintech world or um, in the case of Noel's, uh, which I want to come back to, which is the telco sector actually in South Africa, um, alongside the 
fintech players. Um, and, and, and then the question of so consumer trust, how it's all sealed around this. I want us to get deeper into that. Noel, in the case of South Africa, um, there's something you found that was particularly interesting um, around you know, um, the, the environment of innovation, the fintech innovation world, but also the, the, the primacy, if you will, of the telco sector. Could you give us more context on that and how that creates a cyber risk, essentially, for consumers? Yes, thanks, Nigeria. So, yes, obviously, with, within, you know, financial inclusion, what we know is that most South Africans connect, connect to the internet by mobile connectivity not fixed line um, type of connectivity. So, so the primacy of mobile um, apps is, is really where it's at. So one then has to have a look at, okay, so how, how well do the mobile companies work with the banking sector, for example, or do the regulators of both sectors work together? And what, what I sort of found there was not much. Um, the integration between the two sectors is not good. And this is, this is driving cyber risk proliferation. Um, so essentially what we find is the banks are very heavily regulated. They may even argue over-regulated at this point. And the, the mobile sector has um, fallen quite far behind that. So essentially they're only now setting up um, the CSIRT, which is going to be called Comric. It's, it's slowly getting underway. That, that's more than a decade uh, behind what the banks did with Sabric. Um, so, so we have that. Uh, but we, we've also found that the regulator has been um, not, not operating optimally, if I can put it that way. Uh, so what we've had is um, a fair amount of strange practices within, within the mobile telecommunications industry, which really, um, I think, escalate consumer risk. Uh, and and a, a lack of accountability on the part of both the regulators and the mobile operators for some of these things. So one of these issues is is the proliferation of, of WASPs or wireless application service providers who um, provide services off the back of the MNOs. They pay the MNOs to be able to use their platforms. Um, but obviously now the consumer data is shared with these people because you they operate by sending you SMSs and offering you subscriptions. And very often, uh, consumers unwittingly actually end up subscribing to these services. I'm, I'm one of those victims. Um, so um, I don't think it's necessarily um, something that most people can avoid. Uh, the, these things abound. But also aligned with that, what we're seeing is um, some persistent risks which just aren't fixed, one of which is some swaps. And in fact, actually, this last week, the um, the regulator has announced that they would like the cell phone companies to have a look at introducing biometrics, uh, biometric authentication for customers to curb some swaps, which they say is really eating the consu consumers alive. Um, and what we see Comric is saying, they're going to go and have a good think about this, but one of the questions that they want answered is who's going to pay for this? And of course, this is part of the problem we're looking at in South Africa is with the amount of regulation legislation, compliance-based legislation and regulation, that has brought in a massive cost to all businesses right across the spectrum. And now when you really start trying to implement risk-adapted strategies on top of that, it's another financial burden. And it's no secret South Africa's economy is struggling. We cannot get away from the fact that we've gone through a decade of what is termed state capture. It has cleaned out our fiscus. It's left the current government reeling. The current administration is doing its very best to work its way back. Um, anyway, so we have a new minister in charge of, of Department of Telecommunications and she's young, she's dynamic and she's stepping up and she's now putting the pressure on. So what we're also starting to see within South Africa is, is a new appreciation of what we need to do to start clawing our way back. Um, so this whole mobile space is evolving, but as things currently stand, it's, it's quite problematic, yeah. Thanks. And let me just also um, ask you to explain the concept of digital deprivation, because you have these insecurities or uh, risks that uh, consumers are facing based on mobile 
could be unstructured supplementary service data, USSD, um, or mobile apps. But as more and more of these services go digital, you introduce this concept of digital deprivation where um, especially new or low risk users, um, uh, rather, sorry, low um, profile users then end up in a risk dynamic because the cost of connecting to security has is a huge jump. So maybe you can explain to our listeners um, that fascinating concept of digital deprivation. Thank you. Um, yes, so this was a concept that I came upon um, doing my research for this. And essentially what, it, what a digital deprivation looks at essentially is how do people access the internet? And then secondly, what choices do they make once they're online? Um, and if we look at lower income, income consumers, they then digital deprivation starts making a difference here. At the end of the day, security is about people, it's not about technology. And this is something we all need to understand when we design cybersecurity interventions, whether they're policies or technical interventions. So essentially, digital deprivation comes down to a number of things. Um, what type of hardware and software platforms do people have access to when they access the internet? Uh, and the level of digital literacy uh, so are they making smart choices in terms of security? And then, of course, the issue of um, how, how, much, how much access they have, for example, to data, so that they're not doing things like using public Wi-Fi. And, of course, in the South African context, what we're finding is the poor are, have access only to usually quite old cell phones. Um, so they're using older legacy platforms. They don't have the kind of data they need to download what we all know, a software update is quite an onerous, an, an operating system update is an onerous thing to get onto your phone if you, you know, especially if you're going over edge, which you often see in um, rural areas, edge or, or if you're lucky, 3G. Um, so that's a problem, but the data costs are a problem. Security software, buying um, even the downgraded package beyond what most households can afford. Honestly, so so that that already, and then of course um, we have to say in South Africa that if we look at cyber capacity building, people being being uh, taught or exposed to cyber awareness type of programs, we just don't see it. Um, it's not a feature in advertising. The banks try their best on their websites. Okay, so we have this thing where we we lower income users now are have this problem but then on top of that is the way that cell phone companies sell data package data and she'll be talking about the poverty premium the poorer the user the more they pay for data and the more they pay for data the less data they have so they're definitely going to be using the public wi-fi so it's not uncommon to find people standing around a restaurant that has wi-fi standing around outside trying to pick up some sort of a signal so that they can do some kind of quick transaction or send a message. So inevitably what we see is there's a lot of alliance still on SMS-based um, sales or ways of interacting using SMS, USSD type of functionality, which is very, very insecure. Um, and the government has tried very hard to get the cell phone companies to bring down their data prices, some of the highest in Africa, um, without too much success, putting pressure on. There have been some concessions but uh, we're, not, we're not seeing the type of data prices that I think should be out there. The companies make significant profits. And the, all of these factors together, again, the dynamics are, are driving problems for us. And one last thing, cyber capacity building. Uh, we see a lot of that um, both by, within Africa and from outside of Africa, but it does tend to pass by lower income communities. It's very much aimed at the top, for example, building national capacities or certain business capacities, but we really don't see cyber capacity building in terms of human capacity building, if I can put it that way. Thanks for that. And I think that has emerged as one key question we all want to explore through CyberFi. When we talk about cyber capacity building writ large, which segments of the vast market, it could be users, what kind of user profile is being considered when a program is being designed, or even in the government space, is it just a focus on telecommunication sector regulators or financial sector regulators, but not say the judiciary? So this is a really interesting question we're hoping um, through this project to continue exploring. Elizabeth, let me come to you because in Nigeria, we find that 
the regulatory environment is vibrant. There's a law even, it seems that it's almost like anticipating where the innovations uh, in the financial sector space are going. But so far as how they're helping in, in consumer trust, do tell us a bit more about what you found and, and you know the challenges that lie there even for the sort of middle actors, be they banks uh, or other service providers and users as well amidst all these regulations and guidelines that are in the market. Thank you, Nigeria. So um, here in Nigeria, um, the CBN um, established the Consumer Protection Department sometime in 2012. Um, amongst the responsibility of the Consumer Protection Department, basically to ensure that banks are accountable to their customers, ensuring that customers um, are able to seek redress. One of the responsibilities of the CPD is also to, is also to promote um, end user awareness and sensitization. Like Noel said when she was um, speaking, um, at the core of security, we have consumers, we have the people, we have the end users. Also, I mentioned earlier, when we talk about digital financial services, we also have the end users, people who get to use some of these services. And I also highlighted quite a number of regulatory frameworks and instruments that have been put out by the CBA. Um, however, we also need to speak. It's, it's one thing to have mm -hmm. all of these um, very beautiful instruments. It's another thing to see them in full effect um, implementation. And there are quite a number of um, reasons why we may be recording um, low implementation for some of these instruments. Um, one of which would be um, the end user level of awareness. Um, Noel also mentioned when she was talking about digital deprivation, right? Um, their access to how do they get to connect to the internet? Um, that's one thing that we see when we're trying to talk about the level of awareness of the end users. Another thing um, would also speak to the capacity of the operators, of the operatives for these banks, right? Um, these um, instruments that have been set out, we need people to actually implement um, some of the things that have been outlined. So what's the level of capacity um, of these people? Now that's a responsibility on the end of um, service um, providers. Now looking at um, a number of activities in the past few years within the Nigerian um, financial ecosystem, um, yes, the CBN has been doing quite a number of work. Um, I think sometime in 2021, the CBN had reported that um, they have been able to um, refund over 89 billion naira to um, cons consumers um, who were seeking redress um, with their bank. And that's really, really commendable. Um, also, we cannot turn a blind eye to a number of conversations that have been going on online, um, especially on Twitter, right, where people complain that um, they get to report incidents and they do not get um, feedback from their banks. Um, so one of the things that the CPD does when people have issues with their banks, you can send an email and copy the CPD, right? We have witnessed um, banks quickly responding when um, the CPD um, is being copied. Um, I think the, when, when it was launched, there was a lot of buzz and activity around that where banks were quickly responding to incidents. But over a period of time, people have uh, expressed displeasure. The, the level of response from the CPD has reduced. Sometimes banks do not exactly care. Now, in the middle of my research, I actually uncovered an individual who took it as a personal responsibility to try to help end users, consumers, basically, to seek redress um, with um, their bank. It's interesting that he, do he does this for no fee. He was just really passionate and was concerned as to how people were having conversations online and how they were not getting feedback and response from their banks. And he mentioned something for somebody who, who has been doing this for about three to four years. He copies the CPD, but has never gotten a uh, feedback or response from the CPD, um, the CPD itself. However, yes, he may have recorded some successes in seeking redress um, from some of these um, financial institutions. But when we're talking about the figures, um, the, percent, the, the percentage of um, feedback and positive um, responses he has gotten and the no results and no responses, the total silence, um, total silence the, is totally higher than um, the positive um, outcome from all of this. So it brings me back to what I had mentioned earlier. We have really, really beautiful um, procedures on paper. We have really 
really beautiful instruments, frameworks, and guidelines. Um, but more needs to be done when it comes to um, implementation of, um, of, of some of these um, frameworks. Absolutely. What that is should be the stuff of interesting discussions. Tobslin, having taken um, or focused on sort of like the startups who are trying to innovate in the financial technology sector in Cameroon, what did you find about their awareness of what's happening at CMAC level, sort of like regional level and national level? Are they paying attention? Do they know the laws? Do they know the regulators? Tell us a bit more about what you found. Yeah, that was an interesting find for me. Uh, even uh, as the person studying that, I was actually uh, surprised by what I found. Uh, I wasn't expecting what I found. Um, so basically, I found that um, the startups which I interviewed, none of them was aware of the, re the cybersecurity regulator. They were aware of the regional uh, regulations that are related to the financial services, but none was aware of the regulation for cybersecurity. However, 80% of them thought that cybersecurity was critical for their business. And they had implemented <laughs> Uh, measures to 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 secure their their services. So I found that very interesting, because um, I, my thinking was uh, considering that the 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 the, the in a country where uh, laws are very very um, most most policies are passed through laws, right? They would that would be the driver of if and if if any security was being put into into their business but it surprisingly it wasn't because they weren't even aware of 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 the laws they weren't aware of the regulator yet they were uh they were they really had this big focus on on cyber security now um while the study doesn't unearth what these forces are which are driving um, this cybersecurity adoption by the fintech startups. Um, one thing it, 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 that it appeared, it appeared to me that if, if well-defined and fair regulations um, were developed and, and regulations which pay attention to the nuances and, and, and these little characteristics of the fintech sector, uh, and this is especially because most fintech uh, startups are in need of funding and, and all of that. So I'm pretty sure they don't have this sort of budgets to secure their services from day one. So if that sort of regulation, which is a, is a way of these nuances was 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 developed, I think it, 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 it if, if we combine this with the existing forces that are pushing um, the startups to secure their services, it will it will really um, uh, provide uh, some some consistency and predictability in security uh, in in the financial services in Cameroon. Um, then um, uh, the other thing I've mentioned already that. The, the, none of them was aware. So obviously, that is uh, it speaks for itself that awareness is a is a huge thing that um, is missing in the in 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 the country because the the laws have been there since 2010. The 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 regulator is active. They even have a, a radio program where they the they, they attempt to 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 bring some awareness, but uh, questions as to how that is designed and and how it targets, I suppose, uh, starts being asked. But yeah, uh, some some uh, proper industry, probably sector specific awareness is required, not not just a general um, uh, country awareness. Perhaps uh, is is something I thought uh, is 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 missing in 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 Cameroon. Um, coming out of the study. Um, yeah, and, and then the, the, the other thing I noticed was um, um, 
culturally in Cameroon, um, if if you think about reporting crime, obviously you think about the police force, right? You the police, and and so um, what what caught my attention was the fact that I had to to do a couple of gymnastics to even find on the the where the police is is even um, how the police even underst- uh, the the understanding of the police force of cyber security it, the, there is no no information whatsoever um, that the public can access in terms of how they report uh, crime to the police. Um, there is a, a there is uh, a, a, a unit uh, which is a special a special unit sitting um, in the police force uh, which um, actually investigates crimes that are reported to the regulator, not to the police force, to the regulator. Then this is investigated by this special unit. Uh, but um, yeah, there is no no easy way to to have any reporting by the general public or even, I guess even businesses because um, it's all, all that's available uh, publicly and easily on the internet is an email address on on the regulator's website, and so that 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 was what I found um, looking at and the results of the study. Interesting stuff. I think there's two additional or three additional aspects we hear a lot um, in sort of like cyber speak that you've brought up and I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts about them. Awareness. So awareness for whom and in terms of what actions can be taken. And I'm thinking of this, for example, in the context of, let's say we take Nigeria hypothetically here and you design a campaign, right, for the end user to be aware of all the regulations that are there to protect the market. Uh, is that really, so like awareness for whom, what are, for you, what do you assess as the most important next step in your market that you studied in terms of this question of awareness? The other one that's come up is information sharing. What your thoughts all are? I think Tom Lean has nailed it. It's really informational gymnastics. And it's usually very difficult to then compare to other markets that have more standardized ways of information sharing. Um, and here, information might be more informal. It might be conversational rather than a written report. I'm just curious for, bo- uh, for all of you, um, what are some of the things you're thinking about how people can better understand the fact that it's not that there's an absence of awareness per se, or an, an absence of capacity or an absence of information sharing. It just works differently in these markets. I'm just curious, um, you know, Noel, Elizabeth, Tomslin, how you see if you were explaining to somebody who's studying or hearing about these markets for the first time, some sort of contours, how they can navigate that, um, not to assume that it's all just blank slates in Africa. <laughs> all right, um, <laughs> if I can speak to that first. Um, when Tomsley was speaking, I was nodding my head so much because I agree with him. And one thing that's common across um, South Africa, Cameroon, and Nigeria is the need for awareness. Now, like you rightly mentioned, there, there's awareness across um, different levels. So we can talk about awareness for end users on how to use some of these digital services and um, how to security best practices, basically. There's also awareness, an awareness of the instruments um, in place. For example, um, here in Nigeria, for an end user to know all of the instruments um, that exist and know how to use them. Um, I do not exactly want to say how to weaponize them, but basically how to use them to hold your service providers accountable, right? Um, knowing that you can walk up to your service provider if there is an incident and tell them what's in on the books and how this can go against them, how much fine they have to pay if they do not um, respond to a particular incident. Thompson also mentioned something on the capacity of law enforcement. Um, he mentioned the police. I think that's also very important because if I, as an individual, I know what's on book and I know how to hold my service provider accountable and I am able to report to the necessary authority and they have the capacity and they know what to do to actually meet my particular concern, it raises a level of trust and confidence for me in the entire system, ranging from the financial institutions to security, right? And 
that way, I think we're going to see how things can work better across board for end users, for the country as a whole, for these service providers. Um, I'll leave it at Thank you. Thank you for that, because it, it it ties nicely to a question that had just come in uh, from Nena about whether there are rights based approaches to securing digital financial inclusion. And the way you've described it, Elizabeth, I think brings a perspective that's really helpful, that consumer rights are just as much as the way people think about rights as human rights. If I'm a, as a consumer, I'm aware of the, 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 what I can do, the actions I can take, um, and I can hold on, hold the service provider to account, I think is a very interesting and different way um, to think about a rights, rights-based approach to financial inclusion. Um, so Noel Tomslin, uh, awareness, information sharing, thoughts? Yeah, it, you know, if I can come in on the rights-based approach, I think to a certain extent, that's what South Africa is trying to do. With, a, with the new legislation that's in place. However, how this plays out in practice is something else. So if we look at the recent TransUnion hack in South Africa, 52 million consumers impacted. I was one of them. They know everything about me, even including the engine number of my car. Um, the email that we got from TransUnion, um, everybody was impacted, was basically to say, um, okay, this has happened, but if there is a breach, it actually won't be their fault because it'll be us responding to a vishing or phishing type of email as a result of this. And that, never mind, uh, we can subscribe to the digital identity product and that will alert us to see if <laughs> So there was an upsell attached to it. Now, the information regulator who's responsible for issuing the fine after an investigation has indicated that the fine that they would consider in this case is 10 million rand. TransUnion would have been ransomed for 225 million rand. So now you, you have a look and they're saying 10 million bucks wow you know that's a win um so you now you have to ask yourself in what way is this benefiting the consumer um it's it's not so all all the write-up is good but <clears throat> if if companies literally get away with it and they're going to walk away with it 10 million rand is a brush brush off so we we're not getting it right in terms of the risk that was that was um experienced versus the, the, the punitive measures. And until we raise that bar, um, the, the risk is going to be on the consumers and not the corporates, I feel. Um, so, you know, this is where you look, you have to take a leaf out of the book of the EU data protection. I, I'm quite sure the fine would have been significantly more in the EU. Um, and that makes companies tread a lot more carefully there. Uh, what actually happened in this case was all this data was on one server and the password for the server was password. That, that is extreme negligence. Um, so I think rights-based approaches, we, we, we're trying to go there, but the follow-through is always the problem, I think, or very often the problem. No, I think thanks for that because we introduce another aspect we should think about with a rights-based approach to the question that was posed about if yeah if the, the service providers feel like the cost of paying a fine is cheaper than the cost of securing the platforms they're giving and this could be any player in the game it could be a bank or it could be a startup then we have mismatched incentives there and i think that's a really important element to keep in mind um Tom's Lynn, what are your thoughts on this um nexus of conversations including this question on rights-based approach to securing dfi I think Nigeria, you 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 mentioned something very important about um, the the issue of of whether maybe the, the the company might think well if 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 the 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 penalties are are, are better why don't I just pay that now um, the 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 cybersecurity law of Cameroon actually. If you read it, you see all of these punishments and the fines and, and, and stuff, which has this huge focus on what happens to the company if they do not um, do not secure the infrastructure. However, there is little or no requirement to even report to the consumer that anything has happened, right? So... Um, here comes the awareness part where, yes, um, the, the consumers need to be aware that they have certain rights, perhaps, uh, uh, with the law, but uh, they might not even be informed that uh, 
their data has been breached, for example. Uh, and so they, they're just sitting there not aware. And, and and maybe there is an aspect too of 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 culture that needs to be dealt with here because um I I I know that um uh you would not usually bother trying to 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 take any business to to court in Cameroon because you know you possibly not have any chance of winning right so if 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 your data was uh stolen or if you lost money through um a financial a digital financial service you might just throw in the towel and say well uh better luck another day uh because of this this culture of 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 terrible uh, uh, legal recourse that that is in the country. So uh, I think it's possible, but yeah, those those little um, um, uh, issues that that relate to the actual uh, culture and 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 the way the people uh, currently relate to law and enforcement have to also be considered as well. Thanks. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree more on that. And as we sort of, time is already <laughs> running out for us, I do want to integrate a comment that was brought in that is quite relevant to this project. And this was from Judith in Kenya, who was talking about the fact that while digital transformation has, as everybody knows, radically transformed the financial ecosystem in Kenya, there is indeed a concern that, um, um, charges that are now being in, you know incurred by users are locking them are locking people in into what would i would describe as almost a financially unhealthy ecosystem so you're financially included but in a financially precarious situation because the cost of transferring money has all these charges and part of it is also given that the sector as um, judith is pointing out in kenya is kind of like around a monopoly and this does speak to a question about financial inclusion versus whether all these aspects that go towards including people financially uh, digitally and in a secure manner does translate to actually financially healthy or financially empowered communities. And this is a question that we're hoping to also explore um, through um, our country context, but also comparing to other markets like India, where also there's a lot of movement around um, digital financial services and digital financial inclusion, um, which is also an entry point to digitizing many of our communities. But as we as we come to the, uh, you know, to in closing, I want to just come back to each of you with a thought about one key thing you would advise, um, you know, maybe the government, a regulator, a sector player in your markets to focus on um, in coming days or weeks? No, you can have to yeah, go. I'm thinking there's so many, picking one. Um, I think ultimately for me, it's, it's about um, creating, creating national cyber resilience. Um, and and you know it, it it's really going to start there and we need we need to look at ways partnerships between government and industry and education to to really grow digital resilience um because that's a platform that we can really build off it's there's a permanency and a persistence to it uh and i i, I you know if i had to pick one single thing it would be that Thanks. That is well to a comment that has just come in yet from another Kenyan. There's a lot of Kenyans listening. <laughs> Chabet says, you know, um, ethics and digital civil rights are key to preventing consumer exploitation. Um, and the same thing, um, the implementation of digital and cyber law is severely lacking. Um, in Kenya as well, we have many laws, but minimal follow through. So I think that's a resonating um, second <laughs> issue across different markets. Elizabeth, let me come to you for your closing thoughts on this uh, topic. Yes, um, plugging into what Noel has said, I would just um, like to highlight, um, as we have also mentioned in the course of our discussion, um, we need to have um, living cybersecurity regulations, um, living in the sense um, for our regulations to be able to catch up to innovation, right? And um, that might partly be one of the reasons why implementation is um, quite difficult. And secondly, I would also like to say, we need to take cybersecurity as um, a collective responsibility across all board, from um, end users to organizations, to the governments and law enforcement. 
you know, that we really, really need to take it as a collective responsibility. And that way we can collectively build um, our cyber resilience. Thank you. Thanks. I, I agree with that. But usually I find when people say it's a collective responsibility, it's the user <laughs> who ends up bearing the burden in some form or other. So we'd say collective, but like everybody carrying their weight, so to speak, right? Um, Tonslin, how about you? Yeah, uh, I think for me, it's it's that cybersecurity regulations should recognize the the challenges for small businesses. Uh, it, it's those blanket obligations that they write in laws <laughs> should not uh, should it shouldn't be that way. It should it should. It, sh it should consider those challenges that small businesses have uh, and the kind of capacity they have to also meet uh, the, the requirement to secure their services. Uh, and so some sort of incentives that encourage small businesses to actually secure uh, their services or platforms should be considered uh, by regulators and, and, and policy makers. Absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that perspective, because we do see even with the flurry of data protection laws in many of our markets, the burden, and I think Noelle frames it well in her essay, they end up with a sort of compliance based measures of uh, securing or protecting, um, you know, services or data versus that which is risk based, which is more anticipatory and responsive to the the shifts in the market um, and focusing on the SMEs is a very good sort of like benchmark for whether regulations are actually agile or not. So hopefully there's some regulators listening to us who'd want to um, discuss that further. Thank you all so much for joining me in this discussion. I really appreciate you taking this time. Um, for those listening to us, um, um, an introduction, uh, introductory essay to this project is now live on the Carnegie website alongside uh, Noel's essay on South Africa, um, which is well worth read. Um, Elizabeth's will be rolled out next week and Tom's Lynn's the week after. And stay tuned after that for where we will have another session with the scholars from Ghana, Uganda and Zimbabwe on what we're seeing in country uh, perspectives. As alongside other meta themes we'll be looking at going forward on what it means to build capacity in cybersecurity and financial inclusion in Africa, as well as um, rights-based approach to um, securing digital financial inclusion around which we're tying to this question of whether in including more people in digital financial services, the goal is still to keep them empowered. Do subscribe to the Carnegie Technology and International Affairs newsletter to stay apprised. And if there are any other markets, any other things you want us to, to keep an eye out for, do tag us on Twitter, on LinkedIn. The scholars are all available there to continue this conversation. We thank you so much for your time. Um, do share your comments, criticisms, feedback, um, and we'll be looking forward to contributing to the sessions more. Thank you very much. And have a lovely rest of the day and good luck to those observing. Thank you.